The Atlantean Egyptian path to becoming God. Atum Ra. I am God. The meditation to become the ruling God of your universe. I've just put it up at the thunderwizard.com site. It is free for subscribers of the Warrior 90 Day Lightning Qigong or higher. Or you can just go to thunderwizard.com, click on shop, and you can access the guided meditation video there as well. The meditation to become the ruling God of your universe. We are going to be talking about this today and looking into the ancient Egyptian understanding of the birth of the soul. And if you understand the path of the soul, you can awaken to become the most powerful God in this or any other universe. As always, my suggestion is to question your reality and then change it. As you know, the thunderwizard.com website is the website that supports this YouTube channel. Go check out all of the ways that you can subscribe and get access to many different things, including the meditation to become the ruling God of your universe, which is now there and available to subscribers as well as at the shop. You can also get my books at michaelwilliamdenny.com. All right, the Atlantean Egyptian path to becoming God. Atum Ra, I am God. Welcome back to the channel, my friends. I'm very excited to share this. This is something that has come to me as a result of my higher dimensional meditations, my communications with higher dimensional beings, and it is my belief and my experience that these higher dimensional beings have been guiding me towards this. I believe, based on the things that my higher dimensional friends have been showing me, that this is a path that I understood many lifetimes ago. Uh, perhaps while living and ruling in ancient Atlantis. As you know, Egypt, even the, when I say modern Egyptians, I talk about the Egyptians of, you know, three or four thousand years ago. Even the modern Egyptians claim that their society came from the Atlanteans. So that means we're talking 13,000 years ago. So uh, I have been a student and a teacher of mythological understanding for a long time. And as I've been saying for years, true mythology is not symbolism. It has nothing to do with the Abrahamic biblical mythology. That stuff has nothing to do with true mythology. The Bible, both Old and New Testament, was written specifically to be propaganda that could be used to control people. It is the first mythological collection of mythological teachings that claims to be literal history. It's the first time that ever happened. You only do that when you're trying to control people with propaganda facts. Don't believe me? Go to college and tell me what they tell you. So real mythology, as I've been saying for years, is not something that human beings make up. It's not human beings trying to figure out how the sun and the sky and the seasons. No, people weren't that stupid. True mythology always is something that is transmitted. It is channeled to humans. The Vedas, the entire Vedas, weren't something that uh, shamans wrote. They were channeled. Shamans would go into deep shamanic meditation and they would hear these chants. They would hear them going on continuously in the ethers and they would write them down. They wrote them down because there would be a shaman there who would be singing what he was hearing and then somebody would write eventually write them down and that's how they learned about their gods that's how they learned about 
everything. That is mythology. So even if we're talking about mythology, whether it's Sumerian or Greek or Norse mythology, if it's true mythology, it always is more than just an entertaining story about how the universe was created or where thunder and lightning comes from or whatever it is, you know, the, the very condescending way that people will talk about mythology. Now, there is aspects of that because it's a way for kids especially. This is why we love watching movies about superheroes because that's what uh, kids were doing hundreds, thousands of years ago when they, when the parents wanted to teach them very deep spiritual understandings, they would teach them the mythology. And of course, the surface understanding of mythology sounds like superhero movies. But whenever you listen to an actual shaman talking about the meaning of what the mythology is, you find out it pertains to everything. It pertains to science. It pertains to spiritual evolution. It pertains to various things within the human body. You, you know, depending on what lens you are interpreting it as, you will find scientific truth that will teach you about spirituality, about morality, about uh, the gods, about your own soul. And it will tell you about the chakras, the meridian systems, and it will teach you practices how you can energetically empower yourself. It all depends on, you know, what your focus is. It's going to, it's going to come to you based on that focus. And a true shaman, if he or she hears or reads true mythology, even if they've never once studied underneath uh, that tradition, if it's true mythological teaching, mean, meaning it's been channeled from the light beings to humans, any shaman will be able to read it and they will instantly understand what it means. They'll have a specific understanding, but if you follow and listen to what they're saying and you follow their suggestions, whether it's a meditative or an energetic practice or, or whatever it is, um, you will find it will be uh, a portal directly to higher dimensional power. So we're going to be doing that today. So as I said, I've been researching, studying, practicing uh, mythology and mythological teachings for, you know, my entire adult life. And so far, I, I'm, I'm brand new at Egyptian mythology because as, I've, as you've heard me say before, I've never really been into it. It just hasn't been my thing. My take on it has been that neo-Western magicians are taking it out of context and projecting onto it. And then there's all kinds of confusion like the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which is something that was made up in recent times by wannabe Western magicians. And people just, you know, that's why I can tell. So I can tell you things like... Um, you know, don't waste any of your time reading uh, the the raw channelings, uh, the law of one. Don't waste your time. I can tell you, I can tell you unequivocally that stuff is complete, made up nonsense. I can tell within seconds whether or not something is coming from higher dimensional sources. Believe me or don't, <clears throat> I know how grandiose that sounds. I'm telling you the truth. So my experience of Egyptian mythology, in fact, the, the, the older the, the Egyptian mythology for me, the better. My experience of it is that this is the purest mythological explanation for the soul. Where the soul came from, what the soul is, the explanation of all the gods. And what I've seen, and this is something I've done in meditation as well, uh, experimenting with the things I'm going to be sharing with you today, is that if in meditation I follow the path of that mythological teaching, I can experience and feel myself awakening to a much greater level of 
my uh, divine essence. And so, as is true with all mythology, the gods are not out there. The gods are in here. Now, the gods are out there. The gods are real. I know because I communicate with them. So whether it be uh, Indra or Thunar or whether it be uh, Tiamat, Kali, Shiva, these are actual people at higher levels of uh, dimensional existence. That's why they have so much power. They're no different than you and I. They are a soul and a higher dimensional existence. They are out there. And at the same time, they are in here. They are inside of you. When you can get to the place where you can see what is inside of you and own it and identify with it truly, you will become God in every sense of the word. I'm a big fan of, uh, even though I haven't trained in it, I'm a big fan of Huna shamanism. And I've shared with you the stories of uh, the Huna shamans that I've heard that are absolutely, I mean, I won't take the time to talk about it, the, the powers of healing that they have. But um, it's because they have the same understanding. So there was a Huna shaman and one of his students came to him and she said, um, so what do I do about, you know, all that, the stuff out there? And he stopped her and he said, or at least the way I, I remember hearing it, he stopped her and he said, there is nothing out there. Everything is in here. Everything is inside of you. Everything that you interact with is a projection onto a screen from inside of you. So this is why the Huna prayer, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. When they, when they want to heal somebody, they will pray that prayer. Because the understanding is that that person out there that is suffering, that is in pain, is only in pain because the person who's experiencing them, their internal, their unconscious, which he calls the data, like the hard drive, the unconscious of the person is seeing that person in a state of imperfection, which is false. It's a false reality because all, all souls, all conscious beings are absolutely perfect unless they are deluded or unless we project onto them a delusion. So the way to heal somebody isn't to even communicate with them. In fact, this guy, when he would heal, he would never meet the people he was healing. He would get a file of them and he would open it up and he would hear about, in one case, um, you know, a guy in a mental institution who was biting people's ears off and um, they had to chain him up to a wall because he was so violent. He opened it up and started reading about the guy and the moment that he started having a judgment, oh my God, that's horrible, whatever it was, he slammed it, the file shut, he closed it brought that person to his mind and he began saying, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. And he was saying, I love you because you exist, you are real. I'm sorry that I am seeing you in an imperfect way. Uh, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me for projecting you into uh, a, an imperfect state. Thank you, and he's not thanking them, he's thanking his own internal consciousness for shifting and changing that person into something perfect. And without even meeting these people, if he had a karmic connection, he would be able to heal them, not by doing anything to them, but by healing the illusion within himself. So that's an understanding of this. So that's just to give you an understanding of what we're going to be doing. So we're going to be talking about Atum Ra. And I'm going to be sharing with you the mythology around it. I've got, again, a list of all kinds of stuff that we're going to go through. And if you're able to follow what I'm saying and internalize it, and if you follow this path that this mythology is laying out, and I could go into reasons why I think this is even superior to many of the other mythological teachings that I'm, I'm very fond of, but I'm not going to take the time in this video to do that because it would, we would be talking for a long time. We're going to walk through this. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with that.
Before I forget, every Wednesday and Saturday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we do live guided interdimensional meditations to bring 5D solar flash event. What I just described, when we do these meditations, we're doing that to our solar system. This is easily the most powerful thing that can be done. It is the most important thing. It is the most powerful thing. I have been called to do this. I have been chosen to do this. And if you are doing these meditations, you have been chosen to do it also. I invite all of you. This is how important this work is. This is how powerful it is. So let's talk about becoming uh, the path of becoming a deity based on the Egyptian mythology. So, how to achieve a state of Atum Ra, king of the multiverse. So, the myth of the birth of Atum Ra is possibly the earliest and most accurate myth of the human soul. And I've already said that, uh, gone into that. But one thing I'll point out is that, you know, as time goes on, what's happened is that people have projected their dualistic 3D humanity onto the myth. Uh, one example is uh, the Sumerian mythology. We've talked about that. In the Sumerian mythology, the first deity that arises out of the emptiness is Tiamat. And Tiamat is seen as this evil force of chaos that needs to be killed and destroyed. And the, the god, depending on which city-state it is, Marduk or Enlil, depending on which city-state in Sumeria, because each city-state had its own patron god, and so they would, like the Hebrews, they would say their patron god was the main god. So um, Marduk, I think in the city of Ur, Marduk, killed Tiamat, sliced her body open, and created the universe. And because of that, he was able to establish order. But it's a, it's a, a, um, a distortion of the truth. The order that Marduk supposedly brings is not true order. It is separation from the infinite, which we perceive as the third dimension. So it's really the creator of the third dimension separating himself from the source of energy and consciousness from which he came. So it's a distortion. It's not something we want to do. That's why he was celebrated by emperors, people who were, you know, post and they were antediluvian emperors who were enslaving people. So to enslave people means you have to disconnect yourself and your slaves from infinity. Because how else can you enslave somebody if they're infinite? You can't. So I believe that this myth, myth uh, this mythological story of the birth of, of the soul is actually, I think, more pure and more accurate. And this is why I've adopted it as a meditative process to awaken the deity within uh, all right. All of creation is inside of you. When you realize this, you become God. I already spoke about that. So it starts with Nun, which is the primordial sea of unmanifested potential. So many myths don't even do that. For instance, I believe, I could be wrong about this, but I believe the Sumerian mythology starts with Tiamat. Doesn't even go into the emptiness. So Nun is a space of pure probability. First thing that I was told by a very powerful extraterrestrial light being, first one that came and started visiting me when I reached out, said, you are a probability, and repeated it over and over again. And he was teaching me that I had the ability to choose how to manifest myself and my reality. So Nun is that sea of probability. It's, it's a sea of completely unmanifested, probable everything, including consciousness. So in the sea of Nun, there is no consciousness. There's no, I mean, consciousness is there, but it hasn't 
identified itself and separated itself from just the empty, unmanifested energy. So that's the first thing that exists. And that's what I, what I, when I saw that, I realized that this mythology was very ancient because it, it, it was removed from all of the negative, dualistic, fear-based projections that much of the other mythologies have within them. So, Nun is the primordial sea of unmanifested potential. Inside Nun is conflict between consciousness and non-consciousness. So inside of Nun there is consciousness. You can call it God, you can call it whatever you want. And then this conflict arises within this empty primordial state of probabilities. There's a conflict of part of the energy, part of the consciousness wants to stay diffused and just empty and nothing and just be at peace with complete emptiness, Zen, if you will. Part of it wants to stay that way. And there's another part of it that wants to awaken. So there's already this conflict. It hasn't awoken yet, but there's a desire in there that's trying to come out, a desire to awaken and become conscious. So inside Nun is conflict between consciousness and non-consciousness. A desire for consciousness grows and creates a duality of consciousness. So from Nun comes Apep and Atum. Apep is the first one. This I find very interesting. So Apep is a, uh, seen as a serpent. And you see this in mythology, the, uh, the, you know, the, the world serpent in Norse mythology. Um, Tiamat is represented as this giant dragon serpent of chaos. So this is the first thing that arises from consciousness. So this isn't non-consciousness we're talking about. Non-consciousness is not chaos. From the part that wants to become conscious, it, two aspects of it arise. But the first one is this force of chaos, of destruction. And this, uh, we could talk about Kundalini being this. This is why you have Shiva and Shakti. So Shakti and Shiva. Shakti needs Shiva. Shakti yearns for Shiva. And this is why in um, fairy tales, the bad guy in ancient fairy tales is not a man, it's a woman. It's always, you know, the, the evil sorceress, the wicked witch of the West. Same is true in Chinese, uh, you know, kung fu movies, which are still connected to their ancient mythology. The, the evil, uh, the evil, you know, the bad guy in those uh, movies is always a sorceress. It's an evil sorceress. Now, you could start saying, well, that has to do with patriarchy and blah, blah, blah. And that's not it. Although somebody could distort it to, you know, uh, to promote that kind of distorted thinking. But that's not what it means. It means that pure power, which is Shakti, which is feminine, if it doesn't have a direction, it is destructive. It's like a live wire, it's just going in all different directions. This is why people, when they have Kundalini awakening, if they don't have consciousness, they have Kundalini psychosis. And it's very painful, and they lose their mind. Because there's no Shakti, there's no consciousness, there's no meditative consciousness to guide the energy, and so they go crazy. That's why many people talk about a kundalini awakening being the worst thing they ever experienced. But true kundalini awakening does not have that if you're following a meditative practice. This is what yoga is all about, in case you didn't know. Same is true in Chinese understanding is that people can have qi sickness. And what it means is that the, there's, no, there's no discipline 
and meditative consciousness to guide the chi energy. It just goes crazy. And the person goes crazy. I've seen it. I've seen it turns people into, into horrible, evil people if they're not meditating. So this is the first thing that comes out. Now I'm going to put a label on it. I'm going to call it the unconscious. Very important subject. This is why I talk about the unconscious all the time. And I work with people all the time, and I have for years, and I'll be able to say, well, the unconscious message that's coming from you is thus and such. And it will be completely opposite to what they consciously want. People will say, I'm not, I'm not trying to make that happen. And I said, I, I know. I just said it was your unconscious motivation. So it means you're not consciously aware. So the first thing that comes out of this, the first aspect of consciousness is the unconscious chaos that uh, causes destruction to the conscious mind, to the person's life. Let's see, where was I? All right, so inside known as a conflict, a desire for consciousness grows, creates a duality. From nun comes apep anatom. Apep equals the serpent of chaos. Atum equals consciousness. Apep is the unconscious mind that ironically destroys its own consciousness. Atum is the conscious mind that seeks awareness and evolution of self. So, we have this. We have an unconscious mind and a conscious mind. So there is a subconscious mind, and I mix that together with the unconscious. We won't dive into that. But for right now, we can say you have basically two minds. You have the, un the unconscious, which is below your consciousness level. It is incredibly powerful. In fact, it is the most powerful aspect of your mind that you have, which literally creates everything. And so the less conscious you are, the more destructive unhappy life you're going to uh, create for yourself. The more conscious you are, if your conscious mind has, if your unconscious mind has been cleared of all of its programming, in that it is just a power to serve the conscious mind, that what you're talking about is Shiva. The ability to just simply think something into existence without any conflict. And whatever you create is empowering and beautiful and guides the consciousness of all conscious beings. That's pure consciousness. So we have Atum. That is Atum. Atum, you, if you want to call Atum Shiva, you can. It's the same idea. Atum comes from a, a word that means self-created or self-governing. So this is the goal. You want to be self-governed, self-created. Whereas uh, opposed to a pep, which is not self uh, governed or self-created. It's accidentally just flying around and, you know, it's this chaos that, that, is, is, that needs to be uh, controlled and overcome before you can actually become conscious. All right, so um, Apep is the unconscious mind that ironically destroys its own consciousness. Atum is the conscious mind that seeks awareness and evolution of self. So after, after these two, you know, the Sea of Nun and then consciousness starts to arise and then these two aspects of consciousness are created. The first one is the unconscious chaos and then consciousness arises out of that and now these two are in conflict with each other. Uh, and then... So Atum is the conscious mind that seeks awareness and evolution of self underneath that. Atum creates Shu, about halfway down. Atum creates Shu, or peaceful thought, and Tefnut, purity of emotions. So while Atum is battling with his unconscious, he's battling for, uh, to, to have conscious awareness take over, he creates two children. So the first two children he creates are peaceful thought, shu, 
which is likened to air or wind. And he's, he's a god of peace. But he's a, a god of thought, obviously. So this has to do with peaceful thought. And his sister, so his, the feminine side of Shu is Tefnut, which is the purity of emotions. So his two children are spiritual th thought and spiritual feelings. These arise and come out of him uh, in order to help him become more conscious and have more or ordered consciousness in his in his newly formed mind. Um, so let's see. Adam Atum creates Shu, peaceful thought, tefnut, purity of emotions. Atum then creates the eye of Ra, which is the soul. And then he sends out the eye of Ra to find Shu and Tefnut, which have now become lost in the sea of Nun. So bear in mind, nothing has been created yet. This is all happening in this empty, just floating in this, this sea of unmanifested anything. So consciousness doesn't even know where or what it is yet. It's, it's, it's just coming into existence. Now you have the two the two beloved children of consciousness, which is peaceful thought and purity of emotions. But because they're in this infinite sea of nothingness, it gets, he, he loses, loses them. They, they immediately drift away from him into emptiness and he doesn't even know where they are. So he creates an eye and it's his left eye. And it's the eye of Ra. That's what it later becomes called. But this eye is his feminine nature and it has a fiery essence and it is his soul. So his soul comes into existence. Why? Because he loves his children and he misses them. He's not connected to them and he wants to experience them. He wants to, to interact with them. He misses them and that love the desire for interaction with other conscious beings, the soul emerges. So that tells you why the soul is so interested in love, why the soul is so interested in connecting with others, with self, with God, with whatever. The soul is, is an infinite being of light that is made up of bliss and joy and love and is connected to all other conscious beings. So the soul goes out looking for Shu and Tefna. Now, Atum, consciousness, no, no longer has an eye. He doesn't have his, his peaceful thoughts or his purity of feelings and he doesn't have the love of his life, which is his soul. He doesn't have any of that. So he has to make sense of all of this. So um, uh, what ends up happening here is, okay, so Atom creates the eye of Ra, the soul to find Shu and Tefnut lost in the sea of Nun beneath that. Without the soul and Shu Tefnut, Atom becomes consumed by the unconscious. So because he doesn't have these things to regulate his conscious, uh, he, his, you know, his, his peaceful thought, his emotions, his soul, you know, the love within him is no longer something he, he can, he doesn't have access to them because his soul is out looking for his peaceful thought and his emotions. He becomes now vulnerable to Apep, the unconscious destructive mind. This is like every time, you know, this is a very human thing. We're very lonely. People become very alone. And when they're alone, they feel worthless and unloved and all of that, as well as just it's, it's painful to feel alone and disconnected. So he's feeling that. And what happens when we feel that? This negative thought comes in. Our consciousness comes in and starts devaluing us. 
telling us we're no good, nobody loves us, we're a piece of gar garbage, if only we were rich, if only we were better looking, if only we were younger, if only we were skinnier, if only we were taller, if only we were, you know, whatever, famous, fill in the blank, more, more talented, smarter, stronger, whatever. So that's the unconscious mind trying to, desperately trying to regulate itself. So his unconscious mind kicks in and starts devaluing him. And he becomes lost and now he's fighting with this, with a pep, with the serpent of chaos and destruction. His own unconscious is now fighting against him because he doesn't have the tools that he once had, which allowed him to create orderly evolutionary progress because the unconscious mind, if you have that, will obey you. You will overcome it and it will obey you and it will create for you. So Atum is now lost and he's, he's, his unconscious mind is beginning to overtake him and create chaos. All right, so without the soul, Shu Tefnut, Atum becomes consumed by Apep, the serpent of chaos. Atum then creates a second eye, which is the eye of Horus, which is the meditative mind, and his consciousness returns. Now, what's interesting about this is that the eye of Horus is what uh, gives kings the ability to rule. If you look back at the uh, one of my recent videos about the Atlantean eye and the eye of Horus, that's what I believe happened, that back then, even, even though that was, as we look back into the yugas, that was during Satya Yuga, people were connected to spirituality, but it was, as now I'm remembering, I'm little bits and pieces I'm beginning to remember of my life back then in, uh, as the king of Atlantis, um, I'm realizing that I was immature in a lot of way, a lot of ways. I mean, the consciousness was, was there, the connection to spirit was there, the access to uh, spiritual technologies and, and meditative technologies were there, but I was immature. And that immaturity is what led me down the path that got me into all the trouble, if you've been following my channel. Uh, I, as you know, it was very emotionally, uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was horrific going back and experiencing the shame of all of that. I'm now feeling a lot better because I'm realizing I'm not that person. I'm not, I'm not that much younger soul. Had a lot of power, a lot of wisdom, but didn't have a lot of experience. Didn't have a lot of maturity comparatively speaking. So when the yugas started to descend, I didn't have the strength of mind to prevent myself from going into fear, insecurity, and eventually corruption. So I no longer feel as bad. I forgive myself because I've, I've, it's, I'm, not that, I'm not the same person I was 13,000 years ago. Uh, how did we get on that? I don't know. All right, so um, Atum creates the second eye of Horus, the meditative mind, and his consciousness returns. So um, now this is a superfic superficial physical uh, ability to rule. So the eye of Horus lands on top of or gives legitimacy to physical kings, kings who literally control others with their power. Now, the, if somebody follows the true Eye of Horus, they will be a good king. They will be a good provider. They will bring order and righteousness and healing to everybody because the Eye of Horus is associated with that. But it is his masculine side and it represents the moon, the meditative mind. So what ends up happening here is that his soul, which is his, his love, his joy, his bliss, many of those very positive emotions, the true essence of his being, which is his soul, that 
um, becomes overtaken with love and connection with his two children, peaceful thought and purity of emotions. And it gets lost looking for that, the need, the desire, the love for intimacy, because that's what that is. So in order to survive that apparent loss, he needs to learn the discipline of meditation. And this is why he creates a second eye, the eye of Horus. But it is it becomes more of a physical... Now, the, the physical world hasn't been created yet, but it's something that will be more of a physical uh, kind of control, even though it is the meditative mind. So, the medita again, meditation is extremely important. Without meditation, you cannot... You cannot subjugate your unconscious mind and you cannot bring your emotions into alignment with your conscious awareness. You need to have the discipline of the meditative mind, your intuition. So intuition isn't the same as the soul. Anyway, these are things we can continue to explore and meditate on. All right, so uh, Atum creates his second eye, the masculine, which is the eye of Horus, and his consciousness returns and he begins to gain control over his unconscious mind. Now, he's not done. He needs more tools. So Atum creates Thoth, which is wisdom, to write the laws of existence. So Thoth, I really appreciated when I heard this. Um, so I'll share a little bit of what's been happening to me in my meditative states. So when I first, you know, the first time that this enormous light being came to me and called me supreme ruler of the universe and then uh, told me that I was a king and um, that this was going to be hard for me to hear because you have a karmic duty to balance earth because uh, you actually, because of the mistakes that you made, you were a powerful king. You created the infrastructure by which now the corrupt elites are ruling the world, etc., uh, etc. Et so, again, the point was that, you know, you're king of earth. And I was like, what? And then the next thing I know, uh, the, my bedroom is filled with thousands of beings who are prostrating themselves before me and saying, Sir, how can I be helpful to you? I am the master of timelines. Another one shows up and I am the master of this and how can I serve you and all these things. And I, I had no idea what the hell was going on. I really thought I had lost my mind. Why are all of these incredibly powerful beings, I can feel their power. Why are they treating me like a, like a king? I have no idea what the hell is going on. So uh, it's, uh, just to be polite, as they would come in and they would say, I'm here, tell me what you want. I'm here whenever you need me. I'm here to, to answer your call and to obey your commands. And, uh, you know, I had no idea who they were. What, I mean, I was starting to lose it. So I said out loud, I said to who there was at one point, I think a being came to me and said, I'm your secretary. I didn't know what that meant. Why did I need a secretary? But at some point I said, uh, which one of you is my secretary? And a being showed up and said, I need you to take note of everything, all, all of the people who are here, all of the beings that are here, and everything that they're saying, because I can't remember any of it. I need you to remember. And I need you to be able to set up you know, when uh, I have an appointment with these beings and who I should talk to and all that, I need you to organize that. I need you to be my secretary. Being said, absolutely. And so uh, then all the beings kept coming and I was just like, uh-huh, th uh -huh. yep, thank you for showing up. Okay, I'll let you know if I need you. And I'm thinking, I'm, I got it good because this other light being is my secretary and he's writing it all down and he's going to take care of it. And so in my meditations, I would go and I would call my secretary, you know, and the being would show up and I would say, who am I talking to today? I'd say, oh, uh, there is a, a powerful being from another galaxy is coming to talk to you and they have a question and the being would then tell me something or ask me a question or uh, give me advice or whatever the heck it was. And, you know, my and I would tell my 
my secretary, you know, take notes and, you know, make sure that that gets taken care of. And, you know, I'm delegating you responsibility to organize all this stuff, right? That really happened to me. I knew nothing of this. I knew nothing of this mythology. Nothing. And it had to have been weeks, if not months later, I was in meditation. And I see what I now know to be the God Thoth. I see uh, that particular bird. We have them out here. I can't remember the name of it. Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. That hook-nosed bird that you know they dig in the, in the mud and the grass. Um, we have them here in Florida. But they also have them in, um, in Egypt. Anyway, I'm seeing that, but he's dressed in his garb, and I'm, you know, I'm realizing it's the god. It's, a, it's an Egyptian god. And I knew nothing about, you know, Egyptian mythology or religion, other than, you know, I've seen the pictures and, you know, heard some of the names, and that's about it. And so I go, are you an Egyptian god? He says, yes. I am I'm the I'm the messenger of the gods. And whenever I would say to him, "Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll see you later." He says, "I'm always with you. You don't need to say goodbye to me. I'm always with you." So, I finally see him for the first time, and he's this Egyptian god who I don't know the name of, and I say, "Who are you?" And he says, "I'm Thoth. I'm the messenger of the gods, and I'm here to serve you." And I went to myself, oh, yeah, I, right. I've heard that name. It's an Egyptian guy. And I said, I'm making up. I'm making this up. I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to go look up Thoth and it's going to be, you know, the jackal-headed god or somebody else. Sure enough, it's him. Now I get it. Because what I'm describing to you was my awakening as a result of interaction with these light beings. They're awakening me to my, my infinite deity-ness. And so the same process is happening. And when things are chaotic and I can't control it and I ask for a secretary, this guy shows up and he comes out of me. He came out of me. This is Thoth. So Atum creates Thoth, wisdom, to write the laws of existence, to organize his reality. Thoth then creates his wife, meaning Thoth's wife, whose name is Ma'at. And she is the application of natural law. So he envisions all of it. In his mind, he envisions the laws and orders everything, how everything needs to be and where everything needs to go and how everything needs to flow. And so he becomes the god of wisdom and magic. Now, he's the masculine, so he needs power. So he creates the feminine, which is ma'at, which is order. And she goes and actually applies uh, practically, materially applies the flow of the laws. Isn't that beautiful? She's the application of natural law. So second to last, Atum creates then Geb and Nut, which is earth and sky. He separated them, creating the dimensional space. So Geb and Nut are brother and sister. They're also uh, husband and wife. And they come out embraced. They're embraced in sexual congress. They love each other. And they're completely inseparable. Now the problem is, if they're not separated, there's no dimensional space for anything to function in. So Atom being more powerful than they are, he, he splits them up. And earth and sky split, and now there's this space where all of this can take place. All of these things can manifest in a physical uh, way. Because this is what consciousness wants. Consciousness wants to experience itself in a physical way. So now Atom 
has everything set up. Next thing he does is he created a body for himself. He incarnated into dimensional space and ruled over it as king. So that's why many uh, pharaohs are associated with Atum Ra or Amun Ra. Uh, because Ra represents the soul, represents the sun, represents rulership. So, what we're doing, if we want to achieve godhood, what we want is we want to become atum, self-governed, self-created. That is your essence. What gets in the way of that is our um, three-dimensional, fictional identity that we've created in order to basically be an NPC in the third dimension. So I've, I've always gotten on people's cases, you know, because they talk about NPCs. But the truth is there are NPCs, but all they are is their souls. They are atom. They are consciousness that has not awoken to their divinity. So they're led around by their apep, by their unconscious. And they're totally unaware. I was unaware. I mean, I had some awareness. Of course, I've, you know, I've been practicing and following spiritual and energetic paths my whole life. So, of course, I had some awareness. But in terms of my conscious awareness of who I am and what the light beings keep telling me I am, I didn't have any awareness of that. They, they awoke me to that. And it has been, it has taxed all of my sanity to be able to accept it. I'm further along than I was, and I'm, you know, farther into just accepting that what I've experienced and what I've been told is true, because it's just easier to do that. And now I am committed to destroying this world. I am Amun. I am Atum. I have created this world. It is imbalanced. It needs to be deleted and recreated. I, along with it, need to delete the third dimensional, dysfunctional, imbalanced aspect of my consciousness and recreate the true consciousness within, the Atom. And this is why people uh, who who are supposedly kings uh, are given this power. The uh, you know, and this goes even back into Germanic, uh, pre-Christian Germanic uh, kings and rulers. They were seen as very powerful shamans, and they had to have the ability to intend peace and security and prosperity. So if you know, if there was a plague or if there wasn't enough food or if there was warfare, things like that, um, then they could be taken out. Like, we have, to, we have to get rid of him. We have to unalive this guy because he's not doing his job as the shaman, as the king. That's the job of the king. The job of the king is not to rule. The job of the king is to project his or her, if she's a queen, consciousness onto the reality, manifested reality, so that their subjects have the ability and the freedom to live their greatest, most happiest, most prosperous, most spiritually awakened lives. That is the job of the king. And so that's why Atom is called upon and why he was the first king of the third dimension, if you will. So, as I said, I have created a meditation. I will create more. But I created a meditation. I just uploaded it to uh, the... Uh, I uploaded it to thunderwizard.com. It is free to subscribers who are at the Warrior 90 Day Lightning Qigong or higher. You get that for free if you subscribe for that. 
If you don't want to subscribe, you can go to the shop at thunderwizard.com and you can purchase it there. Um, and it's a guided meditation. But I'm not done. I'll make more of this, more of these things as I continue to go further into it. So that's it for this installment, my friends. Thank you so much for showing up. Please remember you are the most powerful being that has ever existed. And that the only thing that you need to do in order to be lovable is simply exist. In fact, there's nothing you can do that will make you more lovable than you already are. So uh, I bow before the Atum in you. And if I can help in any way to help you realize the power within, I will do so as I am seeking to do for myself. So um, anyway, a lot of stuff coming up. I think there's going to be a lot of solar activity coming up very soon. So, you know, stay buckled up. Anyway, um, it's Thursday. We'll be doing another meditation in a couple of days. But um, as always, my friends, I love you and I will see you very soon. Please take very good care of yourselves. Oh.